Hey guys, all right, long last, the sixth lecture for module three. Um, this will be the last lecture for module three. It'll take us to the end of chapter four, which I just realized I did not bookmark in the slides, but I'll try to, I'll try to be clear. So here we go. Uh, we're just gonna talk about two figures uh, in, in this lecture, uh, Sir Francis Galton and um, Spencer. And so we're gonna get into both of these guys. And it's, it's a bit of an interesting story because what we're gonna see here, we're right around the 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, and in fact, this is about the time psychology is being born over in Germany um, and, and uh, by, by a guy we're going to, Wilhelm Wundt, we'll talk about him um, and the beginning of the next module. So we're right at that time when psychology is being born. Again, neither of these people are, are really psychologists per se. They're more general academic scientists, intellectuals. Um, but clearly uh, the issues they took up are issues that continue to resonate in psychology. And these are some of the more controversial ones. So we're going to start seeing an intersection between psychology and politics um, that, that in fact, you know, fed World War II, to be quite honest with you. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting period of time, uh, right at the birth of psychology and, you know, right before the World Wars, really. Um, so kind of put yourself into that headspace. Let's go for a bit of a ride. Uh, we're going to start with Francis Galton. So Galton is a, a cousin of Darwin, um, and he was very fascinated by Darwin's ideas uh, and this whole idea of you know inheriting traits from from your parents. Uh, now, of course, Darwin was really focused on physical traits, right? The actual shape of a beak or the kind of claw that, that a bird might have. Um, so literally, you know, the physical characteristics and Darwin really focused on, on the issue that um, in, uh, an organism's physical characteristics will come to fit the sorts of opportunities the environment provides. So you'll have a beak that helps you get the best uh, access to the food in that environment, etc. Um, Galton kind of take, took a lot of these ideas but went more to the psychological. Uh, he believed that even things like eminence, intelligence, I mean he had all these words where they're basically saying that certain individuals seem better. They seem, you know, maybe more intelligent, maybe more eminent, maybe more just natural ability was another term that Galton would use. And he thought this ran in families. He thought there was a hereditary component to whatever this is. So in this quote, he says, the arguments from which I intend to prove that genius is hereditary. Again, he'd use natural ability, he'd use genius, he'd use intelligence. Um, but he wanted to show exactly this, that in, in a large number of instances, um, the men who are more or less illustrious um, tend to have eminent kinsfolk. Well, I should say more illustrious. So he, so he wanted to say, if I look out into my world and I find those individuals that I consider illustrious or eminent or of high character or of high natural ability, if I look at their family tree, I think I'm going to see other individuals like that. I think this sort of runs in families. In fact, he looked at his own family tree. So here he is as a cousin of Galton, or sorry, as a, as a cousin of Darwin. Wedgwood, by the way, was another um, sort of well-known individual, um, another you know, relation um, to all these guys. And as you as you kind of, this is their family tree and how they're all connected. And you see that he's he's got circle people as normal. <laughs> And normal is kind of a, a slam, I guess, um, and, and that some of them have other normal children. So you don't want to be a circle. You want to be a, a square. So the squares are male. <laughs> it's the times, right? And so when we get into the brilliant and the scientific ability, these are the people that, that and notice, by the way, Galton included himself there, which is justified. He's had a strong impact. Um, but you know, what you see, what he's trying to show here is, hey, look at my family. There's all of these males with um, that I would either consider brilliant or at least having a strong scientific ability. Um, and, and so he opened the door to this notion that even psychological traits could be inherited. Um, and, and this isn't, by the way, a controversial notion, really. They've been breeding dogs and horses and other things for a long time. Um, and for example, with dogs, sometimes they want certain psychological features. Um, in some dogs, you want them to be gentle. 
Uh, is that a psychological feature? Sort of, right? It's their personality. Uh, and so Labrador retrievers, for example, you want them to be very gentle with the prey that they pick up for you. You shoot a duck, they go, that's why they're a retriever. They go retrieve it. They bring it back to you. You don't want them chewing on the duck the whole way and then giving it to you, right? You want a, something with a very gentle mouth and a very gentle character towards it. Uh, and so they bred gentle and gentle dogs with each other and they end up producing a gentler breed of dog. Uh, and so this is really what Francis is saying about humans too, that our, our personality characteristics and our intelligence characteristics might also be at least in part determined by heredity. We are really in the, the, the nature craze, okay? So after Darwin kind of suggested evolution uh, and then we have... Um, you know, the actual notion of genes um, and, and how Mendelssohn and, and, and how, you know, the mechanism of this actually happening. So everybody was really entranced by this idea of inheriting things and, and bring it down. And it was all about nature, nature, nature. So Francis Galton is definitely part of that. Okay. Now, He's known for so many things. Um, so that's one of them, this idea that you could inherit psychological characteristics. Another thing he was he was interested in was just what we what we might call psychometrics or measurement and it, and it went beyond psychometrics too so psychometrics would be measurements of the mind uh, but he was interested in just metrics uh, and one of the things he did that was very clever is there was a, a fair um, that was being held in a, in a given town and, and he paid a little bit of money to put up a tent uh, and then he charged people who came to the fair uh, money to have their bodies measured in every which way. Um, now, this sounds kind of weird, but at this time, 1900s, people didn't really have, they certainly didn't have scales at home that they stood on to see how much they weigh. And, and they hadn't, you know, measured the size of their head or the length of their arms. They, they just hadn't done this stuff and it wasn't easy to do. You didn't have necessarily soft measuring tapes laying around. Galton had all the instruments. And so what he would offer is for a small, for small fee, he would measure you up and he would give you all of your measurements, um, which people did just for sort of out of interest. They found out how much they weighed and who weighed more than who, etc. cetera. Um, for Galton, this was data, right? He was getting all of this data. And one of the things he showed very early on is almost no matter what you measure, almost, there are some exceptions, but if you measure the length of someone's arm, if you measure, you know, how big their head is around, how tall people are, how heavy they are, you almost always see a distribution like this, the so-called normal or Gaussian distribution. Um, it's called Gaussian because Gauss actually figured out the function um, that, that describes this distribution, but it was really Galton that highlighted it. <clears throat> and, and so what, what this basically says is, you know, if you look at the measure from someone's shoulder to the tip of their finger, most of the people you measure will be within that same, uh, a same area, right around the mean. So this is the average arm length, but in fact, most individuals' arm length will cluster around that mean. Some will have shorter arms, and but the shorter you get, the less less common that shortness of arm is. And the, 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 the longer the arm gets, the less common that longness of arm is. I probably have a ridiculously long arm. I know I have ridiculously long legs. So, so I, for example, um, look for 36 inch inseams on my, on my um, jeans. And I know that there aren't many other people looking for that because they don't exist in stores. They stop at 34 quite often. If you work at a store with 36 inch inseam jeans, send me an email. Um, but <clears throat> that's, you know, when you get to that long of an inseam, there's very few people that have it. So most people cluster around the mean and we see this nice bell-shaped curve where more extreme values, be it smaller or larger, become less and less common, okay? And so Galton really showed this is true of all sorts of situations. You know, here, here's uh, a more modern example. If you look at uh, pizza delivery, you call pizza and you want it delivered. And if they say on average, it takes 30 minutes to deliver, then what you'll tend to see is the same distribution that most of the time, it'll be right in around that average 25 to 35. Uh, but sometimes it'll be faster and sometimes it'll be, you know, really slow, but it's not fast very often. It's not slow very often. It's almost always somewhere right around the middle. Um, again, normal distribution. So this is important 
Because as you'll see, when we start getting into it, we haven't really talked a lot about statistics, right? Yet. Yeah, we're in 1900. Um, I mean, psychology is just being born, but we're talking about the science of psychology, but we haven't talked at all about using statistics to analyze data. Galton is just starting to open that door by showing that um, things that you measure you know, have this characteristic of following a normal distribution, you can now start to figure out the probability of certain outcomes, etc. This is what's going to lead to our development of statistics. Okay, so that's obviously uh, an important um, part of the story that we're going to continue uh, in subsequent chapters. So just make you aware of that. Uh, but of course, the thing that perhaps Galton is is known for, um, most infamous uh, part of his work, and it is infamous, um, is his work around, um, um, I, I mean, what, what's, what's the right word for? I, I show you some posters here <laughs> just to kind of, um, you know, get, get your mind going. Um, I'll, I'll come back to these posters, but, but here's the word eugenics. Okay. And notice the Hitler sign. Let's tell you the story of eugenics because it's very important that you think of the story in context. This is one of those cases where, and I'm gonna go back here, where when you're thinking about history, you can't really view it from the current lens because it looks ridiculous from the current lens. But if you can move yourself to the 1900s and, and try to think of living in a world where you know everyone is now infatuated by the effects of nature and heredity, um, has understood evolution theory, at least as Darwin has described it, and has started to think about it in terms of humanity. What does this mean about us? Yes, a lot of people said, oh, they were worried about, you know, whether we evolved um, from apes or not, whether we, you know, were on that same path. So there was sort of a backwards looking take on evolution. But some people started looking at forward. How could, how could or should we use what we know about evolution to make the human species better? Always a dangerous question. Um, but Galton was at the forefront of this movement. It was called eugenics. So let me just say this. Um, these are some of the things his research spawned. So one of them is this recurrent question of the nature of intelligence. So he equated nature of intelligence with natural ability and he believed it to be innate. And we've talked about that with his family stuff. Um, he, in fact, Darwin eventually agreed with Galton that the future of mankind depended not on fertility, not on, you know, who could have the most children, but increasing mechanical skill, intelligence, and morality. He thought these were the important, so let's say that again, mechanical skill, intelligence, and morality. Um, he thought these were the critical things uh, when it came to human uh, evolution. And Darwin himself accepted the shift in the definition of fitness. So from you know being able to produce a lot of children to being intelligent. Now it's kind of weird because, yeah, I mean, I think most people in, in the biological world have, have kind of not agreed with that shift. Um, and they still think it's, it's about survival of the species, but it's, it's certainly a kind of a weird, you know, when it comes to humans, it's less about survival. Um, your, your ability to fit in an environment, and this is the point being made, you know, is maybe less about your physical characteristics and more about your psychological characteristics. Your ability to fit and succeed, that's what they're really saying, may have more to do with your intelligence um, than anything else as a human being. And, and this is what Darwin started to say, yeah, maybe that's true. So let's just throw that on the table. Um, so, you know, once you say that, you say, okay, intelligence is where it's at. Could we make the human race more intelligent? Well, here was the, the step that some people made. And these are some of the posters. Um, so let me just start with these ones. Only healthy seed must be sown. Release the stranglehood of hereditary disease and unfitness. So, so this is a starting point. But then what's unfitness mean? right? I'll come back to that. Disease. But imagine disease. This was the notion that some eugenics people started to have. If a given disease has a hereditary cause, if it's genetic, then if everybody who had that disease today were not allowed to have children, the disease would disappear, right? Because it would never be handed down to anybody. And so it would simply leave the human system. Um, and, and we wouldn't have to worry about that disease anymore. Um, 
so you know every almost everything is in that example when you think of it yeah the beauty you know of, of coming up with a world where you've got one less big health issue for for subsequent generations to worry about but also the callousness and the coldness of saying something like you do not allow them to have children like how do you do that who decides who has children and who doesn't and it gets even more complicated when you bring in unfitness especially when you start to think in um, galton like terms that unfitness has to do with intelligence so are we saying now that less intelligent people should not be allowed to have children and if you prevented less intelligent people from having children maybe the subsequent species would be on average more intelligent what if we didn't let the ugly people have children then the species would become more beautiful okay so now you see the the thing that somehow enticed some people about eugenics and there were very serious discussions being being had um throughout North America especially, um, but also throughout the world, there were conferences about eugenics where academics got together and they talked about issues like, well, you know, who should be breeding and who shouldn't be breeding and what are methods of controlling breeding. So, you know, a common one would be birth control, for example, um, suggesting that certain people whether they like it or not, be put on birth control, or or do you actually you know neuter some people, or what you know when you get down to the the the, the specifics, it gets a little freaky, right? But but it was taken very seriously. It was a serious academic and intellectual discussion. Um, you see things like this, um, where this is a magazine. Shall we breed or sterilize defectives? defectives right this is a story in a magazine i don't see a year on this magazine um i would like to see a year on this magazine uh, maybe we could try to track it down in some way uh, but i assume it's around early 1900s something like that and you see this is now a pop story people are just talking about this in the pop media uh, now of course it was kind of an intellectual curiosity um, until we got to hitler hitler was a convert Hitler loved eugenics. Hitler's whole justification for all of his evil was eugenics. He wanted to produce that perfect future race. Um, and so now what is unfitness? Well, to Hitler, if you were Jewish, you were unfit. Um, if you were gay, you were, you were unfit. Um, certainly if you had any sort of health defect, you were unfit. Um, and, and he could define this in any way. And so he would suddenly say a certain class of people are not part of the future of mankind. They are not part of this future race that, that I'm helping to, to create. Um, and therefore, well, we don't want them to breed. Well, how do you not have them breed? How do you not have them have children? Hitler was pretty direct kill them right and so you know it's it's at times like that when people like galton and 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 i think you know americans general saw whoa hang on like whoa this is a very scary kind of direction this is taken um and and everybody started to reject the whole notions of eugenics you know and and, and you know you do not we do not interfere with the breeding uh of people and we will allow anybody to have children that, that has children etc or that wants to have children um so we backed off that but this is still in the background right now this is the thing that always gets me when i when i when i talk about eugenics is that you know yes it rose and yes a bunch of people saw the potential of producing a better species of, of humankind out of it but we walked away from that and we said no 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 that's not right we walked away from it, but it's still sitting there. Um, and, and it's not going to take much for somebody else to, to take up that banner uh, again. So, you know, that's what I, I like to throw out there. It's a scary thought, but, you know, there is still this notion out there that just like you breed dogs to get the best dogs or breed horses to get the best horses, um, sooner or later, somebody is going to come back to this idea that we should have selective breeding of humans uh, to produce better humans. And it's kind of scary, right? I'll let you just think on that one in a, a bit. Um, 
He also, wow, this looked terrible when I blew it up. Sorry about that. Um, uh, just highlighting that Gal Galton also um, is important because he started talking about memory and especially what, what we now call autobiographical memory, our own memories. We will sometimes call them episodic memories too, uh, the stories of our life, basically, the things we've been through, the things we've experienced. And um, there's a funny story about Galton walking around and, and finding objects in his environment and just staring at an object until, until it pushed something into his mind. Um, and, you know, he would suddenly notice things were in his mind. Um, and so I'm describing it wrong, though. But let me let me finish this way and then I'll correct myself. Um, what he took from that is, is the ability of various things to just trigger memories, trigger thoughts. Um, that it's not always something we have to go looking for, right? We don't have to say, what was the name of the person that did whatever? And then we're consciously retrieving. But he would say you could just look at an object and that could spontaneously, through associations or other things, inspire thoughts. But that was what he really... So first of all, he was talking about memory, he was talking about associations, and that's kind of cool. We're going to see Ebbinghaus kind of take up that that uh, banner um, coming up, Herman von Ebbinghaus. He's a character of the future. Um, but this is the part that m always messed with my head when I, when I thought of this part of Galton's work, and I hope it messes with your head too. One of the things he noticed is when he was starting to attend to his, his conscious mind, he would notice that sometimes there was stuff going on up there before he attended, right? So he kind of shifted his, his attention, like what's going on up there? And it was like there was a pattern of thought that was going on all the time and now he became aware of it. But it didn't feel like it just started when he became aware of it. It felt like it was there running all the time. Um, and yeah, and, and every now and then he would notice what's going on in his mind. And so he thought there were all these subconscious processes, subconscious thoughts, subconscious memories always going through our head. The mind was always working. And very often we were not aware of the things that were going on up there. We could become aware um, of them. Uh, and then they would get the special state of being in our conscious awareness, whatever that was. But he didn't, he believed that things could be not conscious, but still there and having an effect. Um, so, so we're really kind of starting to talk about conscious processes and unconscious processes in relation to memory. Fascinating kind of stuff. Okay, so you see Galton is a complex guy, right? He's all over the board. A little bit, he's contributed to a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to go back kind of connect back to the Darwinian side of his work um, as we talk about Spencer. Um, so Spencer's the last guy we're going to talk about in chapter four. Um, but again, um, following up on some of the Darwinian stuff and um, in, in different ways and in ways that continue to be politically relevant today. So first of all, let's start on the left panel here. Um, Spencer Actually, you know what, when, when I suggested to you that the time was right for evolution um, of some sort, um, well, Spencer, you know, basically said, hey, you know, Darwin, I've been talking about evolution for a while as well. And, and he has. Um, and he talked about it in a different way, though. Um, and it's important you understand these differences. So first of all, you know, Darwin is about the evolution of life. How did life come to be so varied and have multiple different forms? And so he gave a theory of how we went from very simple, simple life forms to, to very complex and, and varied life forms. Herbert Spencer thought this was one example of a more general law of evolution that could be applied to all sorts of things. Yes, you can apply it to life, but you can apply it to the evolution of a solar system, the evolution of a person, the evolution of a culture, the evolution of a brain. So he said there is a very common general process that moves, moves certain things. Let's start from a solar system from a very simple initial state um, uh, and, and a relatively undifferentiated state. So it starts with sort of one kind of sort of common stuff. And then over time, somehow that turns into variants of that. So we get more complexity, more different kinds of stuff. Um, and it leads to a much more complex and un, uh, sorry, and differentiated, differentiated system where, you know, the stars are doing different things than the planets, which are doing different things than the, the moons that are the satellites around the planet. So we have now all these different kinds of stuff um, that have emerged from what was a very simple single 
sort of stuff. We know cells do this, right? Cells originally split off and, and they're relatively simple. And then um, as a baby is forming, they become more differentiated. Some become eye cells, some become skin cells, etc. cetera. Um, so he thought you could apply this to almost everything. He certainly thought it could be applied to the brain um, and that doing so would um, kind of help you understand the brain and some of its dynamics a little better. Uh, and so this is one sort of way we talk about the brain sometimes that follows this evolutionary view where we'll sometimes talk about this really center stuff as the reptilian brain. We know even the basic reptiles have, have all of this intact. And so the claim is this is the oldest part of our brain, um, the first sort of stuff that was there, and it controls just our instinctual behavior. Um, you know, the basic stuff we need to, to kind of um, survive, right? Um, so sleep, food, hung, going after food, that kind of stuff. Then the next evolutionary step people believe is the limbic brain, um, which is where a lot of our emotional reactions and, and, and such come from. So the idea of emotion and feelings come up there and that's, that's sort of just above survival, right? And then above that and more recently we have the neocortex, the thinking brain, the rational brain. When I talk to reporters, I often say, you know, we have an emotional side and we have an, a, a rational intellectual side and quite often our emotional side wins because it's older, it's more powerful, it's more, hmm, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but I, but I hope you know. You know, it's, it's a more central part of who we are, and, and when push comes to shove, our emotional side takes over. Um, but quite often, we don't want our emotional side to take over. Um, and, and that's where rational thought can say, yeah, I know that's what you want to do right now, but here's the right thing to do right now. Uh, and so we can have the thinking brain take over. Of course, even with the thinking brain, the neocortex, if you talk about the evolution of, of humankind, you know, we think even that has, has evolutionary steps that the frontal cortex for humans is the most, most recent, um, most recently evolved. So even when we get to the thinking brain, we can start to imagine, you know, evolution within that. Okay, so that's Spencer's more general view, and, and you'll see that applied um, every now and then in areas like child development. Can we think of this as a child evolving? Okay, now here's the critical point. When Spencer talked about evolution, he talked about it differently than Darwin did. Darwin would kind of suggest that at any given time, a species would just by random chance have some variation within it, um, and that some of that variation would fit the environment really well, some would fit it really poorly. So the variation that fit the environment would of course lead to success and, and therefore become more dominant uh, in future generations. And that that didn't help the organism or especially if it hurt the organism would filter out. But importantly, the evolution was towards fitting with the environment. It was just about maximizing a fit uh, of the environment of a sort. And that was the only sort of kind of guiding principle. To Spencer, it was different. He thought this idea of going from simple undifferentiated to complex differentiated came with it progress. This was leading to a better system in, in his view. Um, and, and, you know, Darwin doesn't argue that. So, so, for example, if the environment changed tomorrow significantly and suddenly it was bad to be tall, you know, people like me would be in trouble. Right. And so for, for, for Darwin, it was all about fit with the environment. So if the environment changes, suddenly what was good in the previous environment, a good trait might not be good anymore. And, and new traits might suddenly be good. Um, so it's fitting the environment for, for Spencer. It was getting better. It was moving to a better state. Uh, and a lot of people use that. We'll talk about something evolving and we'll imply that it's getting better, but that wasn't what Darwin, that's not how he said it. Okay. Um, so critical, when he now applied this to a sort of society level or to a human level, he said, what you really want to do is, is stay out of the process of evolution because there are so-called forces of equilibrium that will guide the, this evolution. So things like a limited food supply means only certain people can access it, not everybody. Uh, and so he thought those things were good. Don't get in the way. Don't try to tinker with, with society. Just It's just going to lead to what we now call rugged individualism, what we think of as America, to be quite honest. You know, you're there. It's up to you to survive or not. If you're not doing 
doing well, don't come to the government or don't come to me for help. Um, that's just evolution. You know, the strong, the ones that can find a way will survive and prosper. And those that cannot survive in today's society will, will dwindle. Um, and so he was a big fan of this. The state should not interfere. Do not have welfare programs. Do not give unemployment people who can't find to people who can't find a job. Do not give open access to health care or education. This is all helping the weak and the weak should be weeded out or should be let to dis disappear. So this is this isn't eugenics. But it's kind of close, right? It's kind of like um, it'll happen on its own if we don't muck with it. But if we start um, interfering by helping those individuals that would otherwise not succeed, um, then we are promoting those individuals to be in our society in the future. And we shouldn't do that. So, you know, this is very much aligned with a very strict um right-wing kind of small government notion that every person it's up to them uh, to survive and those that do cool they will they will have a significant um, uh, impact in the future and if we allow this to happen this is what he thought um, it would lead to an equilibrium between man's nature and the condition of existence he would find some sort of balance with the existence which leads to society of the greatest perfection and complete happiness that's a high goal. Um, so, you know, in both of these cases, if we kind of zoom out now from Galton to Spencer, what we see is people applying evolutionary theory uh, and ideas to the betterment of the human species, um, improving the human species. And, and I hope you see, I hope you see why they might think that was a good idea, but also why it's a very complex and thorny idea that can really go wrong really fast. Um, this is where psychology, you know, sometimes understanding the world and understanding things can lead you to believe you have control. And remember control, Hermann von Helmholtz, his sort of way of talking about the, the process of science. That's what you're seeing in some of these chapters. Okay. So that is, I don't have a good thing, that big thing, but that's it for chapter four. Let's kill it here. And I will see you, um, in chapter five next module. All right. Bye-bye.